So, Peter, only hours after the Russian prison service announced the death of Alexei Navalny last week, his widow stood up at a conference in Germany and she vowed to get justice for her slain husband. So can you tell me what she said? Uh, she, she really enlarged the meaning of his death beyond the personal uh, to make it, she portrayed it as an attempt by Putin to destroy hope and destroy the future for Russia. Uh, and that is how he saw himself. Navalny saw himself as demonstrating, manifesting by returning to Russia, submitting to Putin's will, demonstrating that even in the face of the worst kind of aut autocracy, the most brutal dictatorship, you could still be brave. There was no need to be fearful of these, these animals who ended up killing him. Uh, and to keep hope alive, hope for a better Russia. Mm. And that's how she portrayed it, uh, as he had portrayed it when he was alive. Um, and it was a really, it, it was a pivotal moment, I thought, because it showed that, you know, even though Putin kills one by one any critic, any enemy, any threat, and he just goes through the roll call, goes through the roster and keeps going, mm. he cannot kill... He cannot stop the idea of an alternative future for Russia. He cannot kill hope. He cannot kill freedom. And that conference that you mentioned at which she spoke mm. uh, on the weekend, there were 28 heads of government there uh, from around the world. There were something like 56 foreign ministers from all over the world and a, a large number of defense ministers, hundreds of journalists, thousands of journalists, and, and all the rest. So this message has now got enormous uh, new vibrancy around the world because he, he killed Navalny. Mm. So by killing Navalny, he doesn't kill the idea. He only gives it greater uh, broadcast, wider circulation, more force, and increases the revulsion globally against Putin and his regime. And then I wanted to ask you about what she said a few days later, because she actually vowed to continue the work of her late husband, which is notable because for a very long time, she sort of pushed away the idea that she might enter politics. Mm. So is this actually her saying, you know, presenting herself as Putin's opponent now? Yes. You, and you don't have to, you know, have a seat in the Duma or be, become a mayor to become a politician if you oppose uh, Putin, mm. you are taking a political position. So she's already deep in, into Russian politics. Mm. Uh, really interestingly, so in public, she vowed to continue uh, her dead husband's work uh, and immediately started to do exactly that. But what she didn't say publicly, but we're, we're hearing uh, from other sources, is that privately in meetings with other countries' leaders and foreign affairs ministers, uh, she was putting specific proposals to them for what the world can and should do about Putin and Putin's regime, uh, including the, the first proposal was to put uh, fresh sanctions on the 500 uh, biggest oligarchs who continue to support Putin's regime and his war in Ukraine. So she's, she's not only broadcasting the general uh, point, but a specific agenda of anti-Putin actions that she is proposing the world take. So, uh, he, you know, he, he's killed, Putin has killed one man, mm. but he's only enlivened a whole new agenda of potential action uh, and activism against him and his regime of terror. And so can you tell us a little bit more about Yulia? Because, you know, just, just as recently as 2023, you know, she was saying you know, I, I, I don't think this is an idea I want to play with in terms of being being in politics. So do her latest statements, I guess, do they make her Putin's next main target? And can you just tell us a bit about her? Uh, she she is now uh, in the front line uh, of, for Putin's uh, thugs and methods. Um, she hasn't returned to Russia. We'll wait and see what she does. Mm. Um, but she's a, obviously a brave and articulate uh, woman who has stood by her husband. I think, you know, to me, uh, I think she's probably the one who suffered most out of this. He was able, Navalny was able to choose his fate mm -hmm. and deal with, deal with it himself. 
but she's been tied to his decisions and his fate um, and, and now has to live with his death. So in a way, she's been uh, the biggest victim, really, uh, of this latest Putin outrage. But as I say, it's, it's backfiring and she's not going to back down and she is now a target and she knows that full well. Uh, I mean, she's every bit as plucky as her husband was. And is there any indication from her that she's fearful that she's now this next main target? Not that I've heard, but she must know. I mean, she lives, she knows, she saw what they did to all of the others in the last 20 years whom Putin has had murdered in. I mean, it's a very dangerous place, modern Russia, isn't it? I mean, uh, you can, there's a whole wave uh, in the last couple of years of uh, officials who were dissenting and ended up in Russian hospitals. And fell from windows. I mean, really, the, the Russian hospital system needs to get its windows checked. Um, they, you know, they tried to, he tried to kill Navalny by putting a nerve agent, Novichok, in his underpants, so it's dangerous just putting on your underwear in Russia. Um, they tried initially, well, they, have, they are still trying to tell us uh, that Navalny uh, died um, of sudden death syndrome after taking a walk. So even taking a walk in Russia is apparently a very dangerous activity. I mean, what pastimes can you safely pursue? Drinking tea. I mean, he's poisoned uh, tea. You can't with, do that. You, you can't, can't no, that. You can't trust your cup of tea. You can't trust a hospital window. You certainly can't take a walk. A, or your own underpants. Or your own underpants. And, and uh, you know, if you catch a plane, mm. I mean, Evgeny Prigozhin style, um, you might never get to your destination. So speaking of danger then and those who are under threat, I mean, we know that Navalny was Putin's main opposition. He symbolized for many Russians, I think it's safe to say, their greatest hope for a democratic future. But there are still people in Russia who oppose Putin. So who are they? And yeah, how much danger are they in now? Or do you reckon they're likely feeling much more threatened now? Uh, probably they are now feeling that they are in the front row uh, for the next assassinations. Um, one a very famous, prominent, uh, and fearless activist, Ilya Yashin. Um, I interviewed him from his prison cell last year. I think we talked about it we at did. the time. Um, uh, so he's he's been jailed. He's in jail now. Uh, he he must he knows he's on the on the hit list, and so he must realize now that he's moved up one notch uh, on the hit list. Uh, but he refuses to be afraid. He takes tremendous heart. He told me from. The fact that he gets enormous support from Russians, ordinary Russians. He said uh, then, this is six months ago, that he'd had 20,000 letters from wow. ordinary Russians writing to him to show support. Um, so, and, and he made the point that uh, one of the reasons Putin stifles and murders his opponents and critics is because he tries to manufacture um, the appearance of unanimity, that everyone in Russia loves Putin, everyone in Russia uh, adores Putin and will vote for Putin and with an election coming up in three weeks mm. uh, that only increases the pressure, presumably internally generated pressure from Putin and his paranoid mindset of working yet harder to manufacture the unanimity that he cannot mm. uh, in reality get from consenting adults in Russia. Um, uh, Karamurza, Vladimir Karamurza is an, uh, another of the leading opponents and critics in jail uh, famous in Russia, uh, who would emerge, Karamurza or uh, uh, Ilya Yashin could emerge, would emerge as alternative leaders in mm. a post-Putin Russia. Uh, and they are unbowed. So yes, they, they have both moved up on his hit list. They both know it. Uh, and they are, all I can say is very brave, very brave men because they walked into this. They, by staying in Russia, or in Navalny's case, w returning to Russia when they could all have left. Mm. They all had the option of leaving. And remember last year, it's estimated that more than a million Russians left, uh, be mainly because of the war in Ukraine. They didn't want to, 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 to stay. Mm. These brave opponents of, of, and critics of Putin stayed, knowing what they were going to get themselves in for. Um, and they know full well what they can expect. And they have been punished. I mean, I believe when we last spoke about Ilya Yashin, he'd been given, I think, 15 years for speaking out. I think it was against the war in Ukraine. And Vladimir Karamurza, I believe, is serving 25 years in jail. Yeah, um, they, of course, will be most unlikely to ever serve to the end of their sentences. 
Peter, I'd like to turn now to Alexei Navalny just to try to understand, I guess, just what distinguishes him in terms of those who have opposed Putin for the last 24 years that he's been in power. So who was Alexei Navalny and what made him such a formidable mm. opponent? Mm. He stood out because apart from being um, articulate, uh, forceful, as all of Putin's critics have been really, uh, he stood out also because of his use of uh, humor and sarcasm uh, and his effect, the effectiveness of his uh, investigations, his mm. investigatory work. Um, the most famous piece of uh, corruption scandal he revealed from deep within the regime was um, the existence of Putin's enormous mansion, uh, which was legally listed as owned by one of the oligarchs, but was known to be Putin's. And he detailed, uh, Navalny detailed this uh, fortress-like uh, mansion with photographs, um, elaborate st uh, stories of how it had been built, the features it had, the security it had, um, the fact that it was valued at probably more than a billion. He'd spent a billion uh, dollars of, I mean, the president of Russia doesn't earn a billion dollars in his salary, even over yeah. nearly three decades. But um, so where does the money come from? So, and, and, and the humor, I mean, humor wherever you see it, uh, even in, sometimes you'll see it deployed in the Australian parliament. It's so powerful mm. because when people are laughing at you, you can't come back from that. You can't, you know, if you get angry or you rail against it or you try to mount a counter argument, it's, it's useless. It's powerless. Humor is, I think, the most powerful form of criticism because it's, it has no, there's no comeback. So unless you're particularly clever yourself. And of course, right. that's, that's not a Putin's uh, strength. Putin's response was never to name Navalny. He never spoke his name. Uh, yeah. He used to call him the prisoner or the activist the or the something, the citizen. Yeah. He would never name him. How frightened is this guy? How frightened is Putin? Yeah. And how unfrightened was Navalny? I took note when you talk about his joking and how humorous he was. So there was, of course, that documentary that came out in 2022 called Navalny, and it was all about the Novichok in incident from 2020 oh, yes, yes. when that was put in his underpants. Yes. And, and, Navalny, and Navalny said, Putin's not meant to be stupid. If you want to kill someone, just shoot him, Jesus Christ. You know, I mean, isn't that just such a testament? And he, you know, he had TikToks that had millions of views and, and YouTube. I mean, that really did distinguish him, didn't he? Just yes. the, the humor that he used. Yes. And when he did, uh, so after the Novichok attempt to murder him, uh, when he then got on the phone to the FSB agents whom he knew had been, uh, had carried out the attack and smeared his underpants with this deadly agent, um, he recorded the phone call, of course, but uh, he just lampooned them and they didn't understand. Uh, he pretended to be an officer. and yeah. And they didn't understand that they were being, lamp being lampooned and exposed. And then he put the recording out. Mm. Uh, and, and Putin's only response was to kill him. Mm. Uh, it's not much of a response. It's a, it's a pathetic response. Um, and Navalny knew that that's what he was going to end up suffering. And he did it full, in full knowledge and bravely. And do you have any insight, I guess, into where Navalny got his courage from, because that, I think, is what uh, distinguishes him. He's exceptionally courageous. And I know he's spoken about the fact that his father grew up, I think, within 10 kilometers of the Chernobyl nuclear explosion, and that he, as a child, he was very struck by the lies that the government had told, you know, in saying, no, it's, it's perfectly safe here, and they got everyone to plant potatoes so as to show that, you know, nothing's been damaged here. Do, do we know anything else about how he ended up being so courageous? Uh, I'm sure there's a lot more biographical detail that I don't know. But the thing that uh, he emphasized and his actions attest to is patriotism, love of country, love mm. of Russia. Uh, and he said that, you know, when he was, when he'd, he'd, he'd recovered from the Novichok attack um, and he was returning to Russia, uh, when he had, he, he could have stayed in Germany, he could have gone elsewhere, but he didn't. Returning to Russia, he said, um, I love Russia. It's my country. I'm not going to. I'm not going to let Putin mm. uh, intimidate me out of returning to my own country. Uh, and his message was one for uh, one of hope for a better Russia. That Russia is not Putin, mm. and Putin is not Russia. Uh, so it was for him. It seems to me it was a patriotic, a powerful patriotism that drove uh, his commitment. 
and his, you know, his eventual martyrdom. Which is phenomenal, I think, considering what it sounds like his family's experience was, and I'm sure his own. And since Navalny died, you know, there have been all kinds of conflicting reports about what his actual cause of death was. You alluded to it earlier. So do we now know how he died? Will we ever likely know, I guess, how he died? Um, we might never know. They, as, we, as we speak, they've yet to hand over the body. Um, and we've got only very limited lines, I wouldn't call it information, from the Russian government and a bunch of speculation. So uh, who knows what they're doing with the body? Uh, who knows what they're trying to conceal? As you say, we, we, we might never know. And so I'm really interested in something you just wrote about, which is, I guess, what the impact of this might be globally. Some of Putin's opponents have suggested that global leaders, you know, they might have seen this and realized that, you know, their traditional responses to Putin's crimes, sanctions, expressing disappointment just is no longer sufficient. And they've actually called on, you know, these global leaders to declare Putin an illegitimate leader and cut ties with Russia. So what are the chances that any country will actually do this? The countries that haven't already because of the invasion of Ukraine, um, it's difficult to see more countries uh, lining up now. Um, but it does energize the countries that have already taken a stance. It does give them new energy, political motivation, and as we were saying, um, thanks to uh, Yulia, specific ideas for how to uh, crack down harder on the Putin regime. One of the other, and perhaps this is, perhaps this is going to be the most consequential single factor to emerge from this episode outside of Russia, and that is the reaction in the US. It's really put the acid on Donald Trump to declare his position, who he is, his, his position on Putin, his position on the murder of Navalny, his position on the use of state-sanctioned murder of uh, agents of free speech and political uh, free speech and as an essential, obviously, of democracy and all the other democratic freedoms that go with it, uh, the writ of habeas corpus, um, the right of a political uh, speech, a political activity, all of those things. Donald Trump has, is, has, is now under, um, I mean, he's always under great scrutiny, but he's under particular scrutiny on this. It took him uh, days to react to, I mean, he's, as you know, uh, he reacts immediately to everything and anything to get some more traction, to get some more noise. But uh, he didn't react. He didn't name Navalny, a la Putin. He didn't name Navalny for, mm. was it three or four days, maybe four days after he was declared dead. Um, and when he did, uh, when he talked about the murder of Navalny, he didn't call it a murder. Uh, he, didn't he didn't talk about Russia. He didn't mention Russia. He didn't mention Putin. Uh, through a bizarre link, I mean, it's no link at all, bizarre misassociation, he, he himself identified, Donald Trump identified himself with Navalny uh, as a victim. Oh, you know, Navalny's persecuted at, just like uh, crooked politicians and prosecutors in America uh, victimize me. Right. Now, there's a zero, <laughs> obviously, there's zero actual corollary there, there is no parallel. By creating that, all he did was to avoid the subject, avoid having to deal with the fact that the leader of the opposition de facto in Russia had been murdered mm -hmm. by his pal Putin. Uh, now, uh, this is the same Donald Trump who a week ago uh, told us that any uh, EU, any NATO country that didn't, quote, you know, pay its share, fair share, unquote, of money mm. in their defense budgets, he would encourage Russia to do, quote, whatever the hell it wants with that country. Uh, now, this is just, um, and, and uh, uh, another a phrase that uh, has emerged from within the Republican Party, the non-Trump part of the Republican Party that I particularly like, Liz Cheney, um, the former a senator for the Republican Party, mm. famously, of course, the daughter of Dick Cheney, former vice president, mm. uh, described Donald Trump as the Putin wing of the Republican Party and said, we have to make sure that the Putin wing does not get to occupy the West Wing of the White House. So I think he's really, uh, you know, if, if America now votes him in as president, which mm. is still 50-50 according to the polling, 
Americans will now do so and the world will know mm. that he is doing this. He is standing as a candidate for Putin. Uh, and, I mean, there's plenty more ammunition there, as you know. Mm. Just one last one I'll mention is that no, no. on the day, on the very day when Putin uh, invaded the full-scale invasion of Ukraine two years ago to this week, uh, Trump's initial immediate response was, this is genius, genius. And again, on the same day that those, those uh, cruise missiles were slamming into the civilian quarters of Kiev, Donald Trump said, uh, I like Vladimir Putin. He likes me. We get along great. It really just sort of takes your breath away. It's, it's difficult to ask you another question after that, Peter. <sighs> well, maybe I can't answer anymore. Maybe yeah, yeah. we should stop while we're ahead. <laughs> well... I did want to ask you this because, of course, the Russian presidential election is only three weeks away now. Mm. So what will another term of Putin mean for the Russian people? Because we know, and you've written about the crackdown that there's been since Navalny's death uh, on those who are even just laying down flowers, uh, you know, in mourning. So are they likely to face even harsher crackdown on dissent than, than previously? That's what we're seeing on the streets. Yes, absolutely. Um, even to mention his name, uh, as you say, even to hold a flower, uh, even to stand on the street in the wrong spot and you're bundled up into a police van. Mm. Uh, and uh, the freedom of speech, uh, since the invasion of U his uh, invasion of Ukraine two years ago, the full scale of invasion, uh, there's been a continuous tightening of, uh, on free speech, uh, freedom of movement, a continuous tightening of everything. So he's using the war as a pretext to further mm. uh, clamp down on any freedoms in that country. Uh, and it gets worse for the Russian uh, citizens. Th something like 30% of the entire um, economy is now devoted to the war. Mm. Uh, civilian life can't, get, can't be getting any more comfortable or pleasant uh, while Putin does what he can to extinguish any hope of, a, of change or improvement or a future for the Russian people. And you spoke to an expert who said that there's a, a particular bleakness now within Russia because mm. of because of this death. Yeah, yeah. So Lawrence Friedman, who's the doyen of British strategic commentators, made the point to me that uh, Putin now has a greater control over at least the logistics, if not the spirit of the Russian people. Uh, and he has more control than he's ever had uh, as he heads into uh, what he expects and hopes will be another decade in power mm. uh, and therefore you know, with, with the death of Navalny, um, uh, after the death of Prigozhin and his attempted coup, that it just looks particularly bleak. Uh, but, you know, like freedom fighters all over the world, like these brave people who stand up against authoritarian regimes all through history, um, there are others. We've talked about um, Ilya Yashin, uh, Karamurza. Mm. Whenever, whenever one is killed, it, it inspires mm. the next generation. Putin cannot kill them. You can kill Putin, and that's the end of his regime. Yeah. You kill Navalny, it doesn't kill his message, his hope. Uh, it just transfers the torch to his wife, to the next generation who are waiting. Uh, and it's the old, um, you, have to, <laughs> you have to hope, and, and uh, all of the reformers have to hope, um, that the, that famous quote, um, the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Well, in the case of, of, of Russia, it, it, it's, it's very long and lengthening. It doesn't seem to be bending towards justice, but those activists who are, who are keeping, who are holding the torch, are trusting that Martin Luther King was right. And, and on that point, and just to bring us back, I guess, to what we originally were speaking about with Navalny's widow, Yulia, she specifically asked her countrymen and women not just to share her grief over her husband's death, but actually her rage, and she wanted them to maintain anger. She specifically said she wants them to share her rage, my rage, anger, and hatred of those who dared to kill our future. So do you feel, do you think there's that spirit now within Russia? That, that is there a sort of a, a growing rage, I think? Great question. Impossible to know. Uh, we might get some sneaky indicators um, in the weeks and months ahead. For example, so it's impossible, of course, mm. to conduct a meaningful opinion poll in Russia. Mm. You know, someone comes to your door and says, I'm doing an opinion poll. What do you think of the president? You'd be best advised not to answer that one, I imagine. Yeah, which is why he continuously has uh, enormously high ratings in the opinion polls. Mm. 
But there are ways around that. So, for example, uh, last year, uh, we saw an analysis of Google searches conducted from within Russia. So the uh, Chinese regime has managed to completely shut Google out. Citizens in or people in China mm. can't really get access to Google. But they do in Russia. And so you can analyze the searches that Russians, Russian people were performing on their Google searches. Uh, and they analyzed um, uh, millions of searches carried out by Russians on Google in a year mm. and found from the top uh, trending or the most commonly searched terms that people were looking for ways to get out of Russia, ways to get more food, um, are looking for information about how to find out where their loved ones were on the battlefield in Ukraine. Mm. Cries of despair, in other words. Yeah. So the polling, they can fix the polling, but They've, they found it harder to fix that. And so that's a, that's a sign that even before the death of Navalny, and because of the, the horrors of this war and the cost it's imposing on the Russian people, it was already dispiriting the Russian people. I don't know whether they're enraged, mm. but uh, let's look for the signs. Thank you so much, Peter, as always, for your time. Uh, horrible uh, regime to be discussing, but it's still a pleasure to be able to talk about the fact that hope lives on for change in Russia. It does. Thanks, Peter. Pleasure, Samantha.